Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome Amr Duman. Uh, Amr got his PhD at the University of Massachusetts in 1996. Uh, he did a postdoc at Stanford until 1999, and then he joined the faculty at the University of Colorado in Boulder, where he's been since then. Uh, Amr and I almost overlapped at Colorado. Uh, is one of the uh, sad things about leaving Colorado was uh, that I didn't get a chance to work with him as a colleague there. Um, but since then, he's done incredible work uh, in programming languages, runtime systems, uh, also computer science education, which I encourage you to talk to him about if you have a chance. Um, he's uh, focusing, recently he's been focusing on issues around uh, experimental methodology, and that's what he, he's going to talk about today um, with the intriguing title, We Have It Easy, But Do We Have It Right? I had a chance to see this talk yesterday, so uh, I know that you're in for a real treat. Um, I finally want to mention that Amr's also uh, contributed in terms of his service uh, significantly, uh, being the uh, program chair of ISMM in 2004, and most recently he's going to be the program chair for PLDI in 2009. So please welcome Amr Duman. Thanks a lot, Ben. So actually, a funny story. Uh, when I got to Colorado, I actually got Ben's office. And in that office, when I got there, there was a really nice you know, children's painting on the wall. And I didn't have the heart to take it down. So I just left it there. And a few years later, Ben visited. And he kept looking over my shoulder at that painting. And you know, he sort of recognized it. And I said, Ben, it's actually yours. If you want, you can take it. So it was actually his, uh, his, uh, one of his child's paintings. All right. So thanks for coming. Uh, a lot of the research in experimental sciences starts out by trying to identify bottlenecks. These are things that we can try to improve upon. So let's suppose that you want to improve a commute or a commute in a, a city. And so what you might do is you might want to identify which are the slow segments of commutes that people often encounter. And so you give out some surveys to people, and you have them record for each segment of the commute their starting time and their ending time, like this. So you start the stopwatch, you do a segment, and you record the end time. And obviously, you repeat this survey for a large number of drivers, and then you use some kind of analysis on top of that data to try to come to some conclusions about slow commutes. Now, once you have those conclusions, the next thing you want to do is you want to act on the data. So in particular, you might decide that if you could build a bridge over this lake, then it would avoid this bend here and thus improve the commute based on your data. Now, what if the data that you collected is wrong? Well, if the data is wrong, then you end up with a bridge that nobody needs. Now, how could this data be wrong? Let's suppose this is the reality. This is what happens when you're not collecting any data. The drivers do their commute, and then there's a train that's carefully timed to come just after rush hour that passes by. And of course, when the train passes by, you have to stop all the traffic. However, when we are actually collecting data, then we start out by recording our time. We do our drive, but by recording the time in our segments, we delayed our drive slightly. And as a consequence, rather than being able to get to our destination without encountering the train, we have to stop at the train tracks, wait for the train to pass, and then continue with our commute. So in this case, what's happening is that we are suffering from what's commonly called the observer effect. The act of measuring the data changes the data. And in this case, quite drastically. Now I should point out that this study was easy to conduct. We just gave out a number of surveys and had the drivers fill them out. But unfortunately, it did not yield correct results. It yielded uh, perturbed results. Now, if you look at this a bit more abstractly, 
uh, this, uh, this illustrates what happens. Imagine that this red block represents the commute until you get to the train tracks. And this boundary wall here represents the time when the train is passing across the road and so you need to stop the traffic. You can shift this commute to the right and as long as it does not encounter the train, you don't suffer much in terms of a delay. However, as soon as it gets to a point where you hit the uh, train at the tracks, you end up with a much slower commute. Okay? So there is some room where you have a fast commute and then you have a slow commute and then it might speed up again after, after that. Now this is not so different from what we encounter in computer systems. Imagine that this is a hot object, an object that's accessed frequently, and it might be a data object or a code object. And this boundary here now is not train passing by anymore, but it's a page boundary. We can move this object to the right as long as it does not hit the page boundary. Once it hits the page boundary, then it straddles two virtual memory pages. And once you straddle two virtual memory pages, you incur more page faults, and thus your program runs slower. So we can see that as long as the start address is here, we are fine. But as soon as you end up in a situation where the object overlaps the page boundary, then you have a much slower execution because of the additional page faults that you have incurred. Now why do objects shift around? Why would measurement shift objects around? Imagine this is a tiny program that has a hot while loop here and a hot method called f here. And these are the addresses at which they originally reside. Now to collect any kind of a data, we will probably need to add some instrumentation. Maybe we add some instrumentation at the beginning that records time or other factors at the beginning of the program. And when you do that, it shifts everything down. And so the loop now starts four bytes later, and this method also starts four bytes later. In addition, you might add another record at end that records the time or other data that you collected at the end of main, and that shifts f and anything after f down by an additional four bytes. So the point of this is that when we add any kind of instrumentation to our data, and in this case the instrumentation is very lightweight, we record something at the beginning of execution, we record something at the end, we are shifting things around. And that shifting can result in us encountering some of those boundaries, such as a page boundary. Now does this actually happen in practice? What I'm showing here is the execution time of a program as you collect more and more information. So as you go to the right, you collect more information. Here you collect 14 pieces of information, and here you collect two pieces of information. And the y-axis says what's the execution time when you only collect one piece of information, that's the execution time of the program, end to end, divided by if you collect n pieces of information. So if this number is greater than one, it means collecting more information slowed you down. And if it's less than one, it means collecting more information sped you up. Now in this particular case, I'm collecting information using hardware metrics. And so the hardware is doing all the hard work. So it's doing all the increments. The only thing that I have to do to my program to collect this information is basically what I showed you on the previous slide. You have to have a record at start, which basically initializes the hardware metrics. It tells the hardware, these are the things I want to collect. And you have a record at end that basically figures out how the values change and puts them in some buffer or some file. Now, what we see here is that as we add metrics, our execution time jumps all over the place. 
And the change that we see here is up to 10%. In other words, adding this very, very small amount of perturbation to your program, a very small amount of shift, changes the execution time of your program by a large amount. Uh, here I'm showing you the remainder of the program. So these are all the programs in the SPEC 2006 integer benchmark suite. And we see very, very funny things. So here, for example, the fact that it goes up means that adding instrumentation slows things down. But the fact that it goes down here below 1 means that adding uh, uh, instrumentation speeds things up. So in other words, the effect that we observe from adding instrumentation is unpredictable. It may speed things up, it may slow things down. And it's not monotonic by any means. So you cannot say that you add, collect more data and you incur more overhead. It's all over the place. Now on this slide, I'll show you what happens when we also collect, yes please, sure. So this number 9 is getting faster as you collect data. Yes. And it's getting faster by up to 20%. Are you going to later explain why this is happening? Slightly, and I'll show you why I can't explain it completely. All right. But I mean, the intuition is that when you shift things around, you might cause something that does not straddle a page boundary to start straddling one, or you may cause it to go the other way. To get to the bottom of this is very, very difficult, and I'll explain that later. So this is surprising. So here what I'm doing is that I'm collecting software metrics. So software metrics are things that we add to our program to collect. So for example, if you have a database, you might want to collect how many times each kind of transaction occurs. So what I've done here is that for each of these programs, we have identified up to 100 functions for which we want to collect the counts. And so what we do is we first add the counts for only one function, run the program, measure its execution time. Then we repeat this with two counters and with three and with four and all the way potentially up to 100 for programs that have more than 100 functions in it. And what we get is a histogram. It's a distribution. Now, in this chart, the x-axis again gives the benchmarks. The y-axis says, what is the execution time when you collect no metrics, no software metrics, so you only measure end-to-end -end execution time, divided by the execution time when you collect n metrics, where n, as I mentioned, varies between 1 and 100. So this violin, these violin plots demonstrate the distribution that we see. The white dot here indicates the median that we observed. The height of the violin indicates the range of values that we observe. And if you look at this violin sideways, it gives you a histogram, so the distribution, how those values are distributed. The most important thing to note here is that many of these violins are quite high. They are, you know, 15, 20 percent. What it means is that collecting software metrics changes the execution time of these programs by up to 20 percent. Now, you might be wondering if this change is caused by a large amount of instrumentation. So this, these numbers here, just above the x-axis, tell you how many additional instructions we executed because of the instrumentation. In the most extreme cases, MCF, where we increased the total execution executed instruction count by 2%. The important thing to note here is that we have an absolutely insignificant increase in instruction count most of the time. So here, for example, it's like 0.055%. It's insignificant. But 
we see a disproportionately large swing in the execution time of the program. So just because you have added very little instrumentation to your program does not mean that you're going to suffer from a very little overhead. You may suffer from 20 percent. Yes, please. What did you use to plot this graph? The plotting tool? Yeah. We used R. It's, it's open source. It's pretty cool. Okay. You like the violins, don't you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, I mean, it gives you the quartiles and all kinds of other things, too. The 1.8%, is that, is that the overhead for the most expensive? Yes, for the yes, yes, yes. For the, for the maximum. So it, usually it's, of course, less than that. It's the maximum. All right. Now, where did this observer effect come from? Well, we added instrumentation that moved code and data around, and it pushed it through some boundaries, such as the page boundary, as we saw in our example. But it actually it turns out that these boundaries are everywhere in computer systems. Well, there's you know cache block sizes, so you might you might occupy your main your key object might occupy one cache block, or it might occupy two cache blocks. Uh, there might be the entire cache size, which may determine conflicts in the cache, page sizes, and TLB sizes, and so on and so forth. So your computer hardware, I mean, if you actually look at a schematic of a microprocessor, most of it is various kinds of buffer with a little bit of logic thrown in. And so all of these buffers, they induce various kinds of boundaries. And adding instrumentation can push you through one of those boundaries and causing these kinds of effects. Unfortunately, this is not the end of it. The real problem is actually even worse than this. So now, to see the, uh, the harder problem, let's take a look at what we do once we have built our bridge. We say, okay, let's figure out if the bridge actually helped our commute. And so, we ask our coworkers. We do something easy. We just find our neighbors in our uh, cubicles and ask them, uh, how, how did this affect your commute? And your coworker says, I can get to my office in half the time. And then based on that, you draw nice broad conclusions. That is, the bridge cuts commute in half. Now all of you are smiling because this is totally absurd, right? And moreover, if you believe this study, I can sell you yet another bridge. And the reason why the study is broken is because it's easy to do. I just ask my coworker, but it's not right because it's biased. My coworkers don't necessarily represent the entire population of people that commute on those roads. Now, if we go back to computer systems, if you do an experiment on your workstation, your workstation may not represent the entire population of workstations. Yes? randomly removes this bias probabilistically? Uh, I will show you that. It, it, in theory, it can, but you have to choose from a large and diverse enough population. All right? And so in the example of the commute, the right thing to do would be to identify the different sectors of your population and pick randomly, do randomized trials from those. But we'll see if that actually works for us. So this phenomenon is called measurement bias. Now let me show you a couple of examples of measurement bias in computer systems. Once again, I have my violin plots, but this time the y-axis is slightly different. What I'm doing here is I'm asking the question, do the O3 optimizations in GCC benefit performance over the O2 optimization? So let's suppose the O3 optimizations are my clever ideas. And I want to figure out if they're beneficial, so I can write a paper about it. And so the y-axis gives you the ratio of the execution time with O2 optimizations over the O3 optimizations. Uh, I've drawn this horizontal line at 1. So what it means is that if the O3 optimizations are faster, they give you better performance than O2, then you'll get numbers above 1. And if they degrade performance, you'll get numbers below one. 
Now what am I doing here? I'm changing the experimental setup slightly between different experiments. Specifically, what I'm doing is that I've created a dummy environment variable, like a shell environment variable, such as a path, and I'm adding to it to make it longer or shorter. So this environment variable is completely and utterly irrelevant to your program. Your program doesn't even know it exists, it doesn't use it, it's just a random environment variable, much like you would, for example, add a new thing to your path uh, every time you install a new piece of software. And we have varied the environment variable from zero bytes, so an empty environment, we unset the environment, to 4096 bytes, to four kilobytes. And these violin plots show the range of values that we observed by changing the environment. By the way, I should point out here is that we did multiple runs of every single experiment. So these are all statistically significant results. They're not outliers uh, or irreproduc irreproducible. The key thing to note here is that a number of these violins are quite tall. So for example, for the Perl Bench program, just changing environment variables changes the benefit of O3 by more than 15%. So these are the height of the violin. And here for LBM, the problem is even worse. By the way, these last three programs are spec FP programs and the rest are integer programs. So we actually picked all the programs from the spec 2006 suite that were C, that, that were written in C. So we see that these violins are quite high. So in other words, changing environment variables, which you expect shouldn't make any difference. You add something to your path, you don't expect your program to run 20% slower or faster, but it can. As a matter of fact, four of these violins, this one, this one, this one, and this one, actually straddle one which means that depending on what you happen to pick for your environment variables, you may either conclude that O3 is beneficial, or you may conclude that it actually degrades performance. Given all this data, if you look at the last 20 years of PLDI papers, <laughs> how many of them should not have made it to a conference proceedings? That, that's a different and deep question. We should discuss that, all right? between uh, you know more environment variables and it's slow no so I'll show you a graph later that shows that there is no correlation at least that my eye can see Eric? I assume this is the environment variable that the time the program is executed yes yeah. sorry the environment variable at the time the program is the execution, executed right? yeah, yeah yeah so you just set the environment variable and you run your program that's all there is so how did you happen to think of this one this experiment why not you Butterfly in the regular room or something like that. This is the butterfly. <laughs> yeah, so you know, I, I'm working on chaos theory too, but actually the, the reason why we uh, stumbled upon this is that it is well known uh, that, you know, memory layout programs are very sensitive to memory layout. And so we wanted to do things that might potentially change memory layout. Mm -hmm. And the thing with environment variables is that, that when you run the program, the environment variables just go below or above, depending on how you look at it, the stack. And so adding more environment variables shifts the stack around slightly. So that's basically what's actually happening, that by adding environment variables, you're shifting the starting address of the stack that changes performance. Yes, Smith? What about the other processes running on a machine? Could that have made a difference? No, we ran these on basically lightly. We killed off everything that we could, and we repeated every single experiment. So this, each one of these violin represents like several hundred runs where we, uh, you know, each for, we had uh, several, so it had about a hundred different environment variable settings and for each setting we did 15 runs to make sure we were statistically significant. So, so if there was all of a sudden some network activity that messed things up, we would have caught that. These are all statistically significant. All right, here we are trying another thing. What we are doing is changing the link order. So the only thing we are doing is we have compiled all our .o files, all our binary files, and we are changing the order in which we list these .o files to the LD, uh, the linker. Okay? So that's all that's doing. And once again, what that is doing is that it's shifting the relative positions of code around. 
Uh, the y-axis is once again cycles O2 over cycles O3. If O3 is beneficial, the numbers will see things greater than 1. If it degrades performance, we'll see things less than 1. Once again, we see that the link order has a tremendous impact on performance. I mean, this is going from about 0.96 to you know, 1.9. So it's, it's about 12, 13% quite easily. And the interesting thing is that for link order, even more of the programs straddle the 1.0 boundary. So there's five programs that straddle that. In other words, if you take this program as an example, if we happen to pick a lucky link order, we might conclude that O3 benefits your programs by 9%. If you pick an unlucky one, we may conclude that it degrades performance by about 6 or 7 percent. So you can end up with completely contradictory conclusions. All right. Yes? So you said you did 15 runs for a single setting. Mm -hmm. What was the variation of those 15 runs? Very, very tiny. Um, Unfortunately, one of the limitations of violin plot is that it's not so easy to show you the error bars. But in a lot of our other graphs and, and the graphs that underlie this, we have error bars. And they are so tiny that unless you know they are there, you won't even notice them. They are like fraction of a percent most of the time. So we really control the environment so that there was no other processes, network activity that would mess things up. Here, uh, I've embellished these violins slightly. So I've added two points to it. The cross represents, uh, sorry, let me start with the plus. The plus represents the default link order. So that's the link order you get as specified by the make file that spec distributes with these programs. And the cross represents alphabetical, right? So if you do ld star dot o, that's what you get. And you see that these pluses and crosses, sometimes one is above the other, sometimes one is below the other. In other words, it's not obvious that the default link order is the best link order. As a matter of fact, in many cases, it's not the best link order. You could pick a different link order and your program would potentially run several percent faster on your machine. Now, where does it come from? Mm -hmm. so if you fix the link order and you sort of fix the, the, the size of the environmental variables, for each experimental run, do you see the trend that you can conclude that O3 is better than O2? The, the issue is that, that if you fix it, you are biasing your experiments, right? You have fixed it in one way. But if I uh, fix it and then I collect the uh, data from the experiments for each of the combinations, let's say, okay. Okay. do you still see that? The, the trend is sort of uh, towards increasing performance. That, that's, that's what, what it appears, appears to be the case. case. So what you are, so I'll get to that in a few minutes. But uh, we call that experimental setup randomization. So we basically try many, many different combinations of link orders and environment variables, collect data in all of them. So you end up with instead of a single experiment, you have a thousand experiments, and then we use statistical measures and t-test to draw statistically valid conclusions from it. So yes, we do get a speed up due to O3, even though if you're unlucky and are, are not doing this uh, setup randomization, you might conclude incorrectly. Ben? Do, do you get even more variance if you co compose the two things? In other words, do you yes. get bigger binary? They're not completely additive, but yes, you do get some <laughs> exciting synergy effects, if you know what I mean. Yeah. All right, so where does this come from? And as we discussed earlier, the environment variables and link order, they affect code and data layout. They shift code and data around. But it actually turns out that these are only two of probably an uncountable number of sources of measurement bias. There's many, many other things that cause measurement bias. For example, some of them might be domain independent, like the temperature of the room. Your machine may favor memory-bound programs over CPU-bound programs, depending on what clock it's running at. But some of these factors are actually domain dependent. They depend on your particular domain. So there's no way you can kind of enumerate all of these and work around them. So for example, uh, you know, we know from Steve Blackburn's work recently that heap size is one of those things for a garbage collected system. You pick a particular heap size, it will favor a particular garbage collector. You pick a different heap size, it favors a different garbage collector. So you end up with bias. This is a source of bias. 
And so because there are so many factors and really an unbounded number of factors that cause bias, you cannot easily suppress it. You cannot just subtract it out or just eliminate it. You have to somehow come up with a better way of dealing with it. Now, I think this is what Sumit was asking, right? Is this predictable? Do adding more environment variables cause more bias? So here, I'm showing you for one of the benchmarks, but other programs show similar trends. Along the x-axis, I'm adding environment variables, and I add always 40 bytes at a time. And there's one point, and by the way, here you can see the error bars if you look closely. Oh, th this one is actually sort of visible, but for the others, it's, they're so small that they fit within the points. And we see that uh, the y-axis is, again, the cycles, execution time with O2 or execution time with O3, that adding environment variables can make you go down, like this is an extreme case, or it can make you go up. So in other words, there is no obvious trend where you add more and you do worse, or you add more and you do better. So there's no obvious trends. Now, you might also wonder, are these phenomena consistent across microprocessors? So for example, can you pick the best environment variable and the best link order in one machine, and then you ship it to everyone and tell them, if you want this program to run fast, use the same environment variable in the same link order. Unfortunately, that doesn't work either. So here what we did was we statically compiled the binaries of our programs. And this shows data for uh, the Perl Bench program. The x-axis gives you the execution time of a binary on the Pentium 4 machine. And the y-axis gives you the execution time on a core 2 machine. It's really a quad core, but we only use one of the cores in single threaded mode. And we see here that this particular point is the best link order for the core 2. But this point is the best link order for the Pentium 4. And now both of these programs are using, sorry, both of these setups are using exactly the same statically linked program binary. So there's no compiler effects at play here. We have the same exact binary, and the link order that's the best on one machine is not the best on the other machine, and vice versa. Yes? What about different instance of the same microprocessor? We've seen similar phenomena there also. <clears throat> yeah, so we see the similar phenomena with different instances of the same microprocessor. Basically, the issue is that as long as there's differences in cache sizes or buffer sizes or L2 cache sizes, these phenomena can happen. So, in terms of static code size, different links order, how much variation do you see? It doesn't change the size very much, you know, beyond the padding that the compiler linker inserts. But what it does do is that in one link order, the uh, code may appear, you know, this code after that code, and if you reverse the binaries, it may appear in an opposite order. So it's not really changing the size, it's just moving it around. So different microprocessors have different best link orders. So here we ask the question that so far I've only used GCC for all of my experiments. And the question is, maybe GCC is somehow broken. Maybe GCC is doing something wrong. And so in this experiment, it's the same link order experiment you have seen before. But it uses Intel C compiler rather than GCC. And once again, you see these huge big violins, and in some cases, they're actually worse than what you get with GCC. You would hope that Intel compiler writers of all people would know how to get the best performance out of their machines. But we see that we get similar kinds of biases with the Intel compiler as we do with GCC. Finally, you might ask, did we use a poor methodology? So we use the entire spec CPU 2006 benchmark suite, and we use train inputs. Uh, uh, these inputs, they run from a few seconds to up to three minutes long. Uh, because we required something like tens of thousands of runs for this, we couldn't use ref inputs for everything. Uh, we use the best practices as we found in the literature. We use 
minimally invasive instrumentation. So we tried to make sure that any instrumentation we did was as minimal and as lightweight and as optimized as possible. We used lightly loaded machines, killing off all the extraneous processes. We made sure we were using local disks and that there was no network activity. We did 15 runs for each experiment and computed confidence intervals. And we reproduced these phenomena on four architectures and two different compilers. And even though one architecture does not predict the other architecture, we saw the same kinds of phenomena on all of them. Now this gets to the point that I think uh, Shaz was making, right? That can you fully explain exactly what's happening? The problem is we can sort of guess, but we can't fully explain. And the reason for that is in order to fully explain what's happening, we need to know what's happening inside our computer systems. And we, know, we need to know how they are, uh, they are structured inside. And we also need to be able to collect data from various aspects of the computer system so we can assign blame or credit where due. Unfortunately, hardware manufacturers, they don't reveal many of the details of their, uh, their microprocessors. And so we are working continuously with incomplete information. And moreover, they don't also give us metrics necessarily that allows us to capture all the data that we need. So not only do we not fully know how the computer microprocessor works inside, but we don't even have all the data that goes with it. So for these reasons, we can guess why these phenomena are happening. And I've given you some guesses. And I have a lot more if you want to talk to me afterwards. Uh, but it's going to be very hard to exactly say that this is what causes it. There is some element of uh, uncertainty here. Now, how do we deal with these issues in computer science? So in order to do this, uh, we surveyed all the papers from ASPLOS 2008 and from PACT, PLDI, and CGO 2007. Uh, we picked 2008 for ASPLOS because there was no ASPLOS in 2007. So we just picked one year and looked at the top conferences in computer systems. 88 of the papers had an evaluation section. The remaining papers um, uh, did not have an evaluation sec experimental evaluation section. So they were more theoretical or idea based in nature. Now the question that we asked ourselves is that for the papers that had an evaluation section, they might have suffered from observer effect or measurement bias. So we should see if they took appropriate measures to avoid those. Now we found that out of those 88 papers that had an experimental evaluation section, 36 papers used simulations. The nice thing about simulations is that because simulations are, simulators are written in software, you can quite easily collect data from them without perturbing the measurements. And so simulators can help you to avoid the observer effect where the act of collecting the data changes the data. But the question is, can it avoid measurement bias? And so we took the M5 simulator with the O3 CPU model. This is one of the most commonly used architectural simulators in the architecture research community nowadays. And we asked ourselves, OK, uh, let's change the link orders for one program. So we tried many different link orders. And the x-axis gives us the ratio that we've been using all along. So execution time with O2 divided by execution time with O3. And what this histogram says, it gives you the distribution of the ratios we got as a result of changing the link orders. So the key thing to note here is that we saw quite a wide distribution here from about 0.82 to 1.2. Uh, sorry, 1.12. So in other words, we saw almost a 20% spread even on simulations. So while a simulation may help with the observer effect, it does not help with measurement bias. You still have to deal with it somehow. Now the next thing we did was what Sumit was referring to. We could, uh, the next thing that these papers did was rather than using a single benchmark, they used an entire benchmark suite. And typically, they, the average number of benchmarks they used was, I think, 12, 10, 10. 
So they use 10 benchmarks, and the hope is that if you use a large enough suite, then some things might be biased this way, some things might be biased that way, and when you take their average, the bias cancels out. And so what we did was, we took the benchmark suite that we had, which had 12 benchmarks in it, and we computed the average speed up for many different link orders and environment variables across the entire suite. And so if it is the case that using these 12 benchmarks cancels out bias, then we would expect to see a very, very tight distribution. Unfortunately, we see quite a wide distribution that's about 7% wide. And moreover, this distribution doesn't have a nice center, instead it's bimodal. And so, it may be the case that if you have a sufficiently diverse and representative benchmark suite, you can cancel out measurement bias, but at least this suite was not large enough to do that. <clears throat> And the conclusion you would draw in terms of whether or not O3 is better than O2 would be it's 4% better, right? I mean, so that's, I mean, that's reasonable. That's a reasonable <coughs> conclusion, right? It, it depends on what conclusion you want to draw, right? So your, the conclusion that you're worried about is, is the number going to be greater than 1 or less than 1, right? right? So that's a high-level conclusion that O3 is beneficial. But actually, if, you, if this is the point you're getting, then it is beneficial, but it's beneficial by a fraction of a percent. And so the magnitude may still be way off by up to 7%, but maybe you are coming up with a reasonable conclusion that it is better. So if you make your conclusion coarse enough, maybe you can get away with it. But if you talk about, you know, my optimization gives you a 10% benefit, then you have to worry about this. All right, so. So then we looked at other sciences, how do they deal with it, and particularly we looked at a bunch of literature in physics and in communication. And they basically use two broad techniques. One of them is they use many, many measurement setups. So for example, in our uh, commute example, rather than just asking my coworkers uh, how their commute got affected, you identify a broad subsection of the population and you ask from that. So this statistically factors out bias, and this is what Sumit was getting to, and this is what the multiple benchmarks try to get to. And the second thing that we did, uh, that they do, is causality analysis. The interesting thing about, <coughs> excuse me. The interesting thing about causality analysis is that it doesn't try to get you correct data, it just tries to make sure that the conclusions you draw from your data are correct. So your data might still be wrong. So let me show you how we can use these techniques in our community. And so the first, to use many different setups, the obvious thing is we take our program code and we have an experimental setup generator. And this is something that we are building right now. And what that does is that rather than running your program in a single setup, it runs it in a large number of setups. So for example, it runs them in many different combinations of link orders and environment variables. So rather than getting a single speed up number, you end up with a distribution. And then what we do is, we use statistical techniques to draw conclusions from that distribution. Now this is something that's very, very common in the social sciences. Um, yes? Because you said that we don't even know what all these variables are. There might be one million other variables sitting there that we have not even tried to control. Exactly. That's exactly the point. I mean, Shah's the interesting thing is that this is something that all sciences deal with, right? So I was reading this article in a medical journal, and what that article did was that it looked at 49 papers in the top medical journals, and the papers it picked were ones that had each at least a thousand citations. 
Okay? And then what they did was that they tracked those papers and they found that 16% of them were later found to be completely incorrect. They had come to the wrong conclusions. And another 16% had come to an exaggerated conclusion. So it wasn't completely wrong. So it's one of those issues of is it 5% or 10% versus is it beneficial at all. And so all sciences deal with it. I mean, there is no way, there is no way you can get pristine data. That is not possible. And so the best you can hope to do is identify a large number of these dimensions that are important and incorporate those. So for example, if you look at the election coverage, right? I mean, how do they predict? They, they know that, you know, uh, you know uh, whether you are male or female affects where you're likely to vote, whether you are you know, old or young affects things. So they've identified a large number of dimensions and they make sure that when they collect the data, they sample from each of those populations. They do randomized trials. But that's not to say that there might be another variable that they've completely missed. Uh, that is the real determinant of the experiment. And there's quite a few examples in the medical literature of such things where you know, people thought that smoking causes this, but it actually turned out later that there was a particular gene that made you both more susceptible to smoke and to get that particular disease. So this is not something that's new uh, to the sciences. And what the hope is that over time we identify many of these key dimensions and then we have more confidence in our results. But we still have to accept that there might be a particular dimension we have completely missed. And then we are stuck. All right, so the next technique which uh, uh, people use is causality analysis. And the first thing that people do with causality analysis is first you analyze the data and you try to come up with some hypothesis, some causality. So for example, we might come up with the causality that when you change the environment size, it affects the address of the stack which affects performance. Now the next thing you do with causality analysis is you come up with an intervention. You come up with a way of breaking one of the links in your causal chain. So in this case, we might break this link by forcing the stack to always start at the same address no matter what the environment variable value is. And then you try to validate your hypothesis. So you do that by saying, okay, now I'm going to change the environment size. And if the performance changes with the changing environment size, then I can conclude that my hypothesis was incorrect. But if the performance does not change, then it must mean that breaking this link is what caused that to happen. And so thus, I have built up some confidence that my original chain of hypothesis was actually correct. Okay. So this is popular in the sciences, the natural sciences in particular, but this is incredibly difficult to do because to come up with an intervention that you can use to break a link is very, very hard. It requires significant creativity. So it's not an easy solution. So let me wrap up by giving a call to action, things that we could try to do as a community. I think the first thing we ought to try to do is we need to reward careful experimentation. We need to be willing to accept papers that may not necessarily have new algorithms in it, but have very, very deep and insightful experimentation. In other words, we need to recognize that coming up with great new creative algorithms requires a lot of deep thinking, but also evaluating other people's algorithms requires a lot of deep thinking. So we need to recognize that there are two kinds of contributions we can make, and both of them should be valued. So this requires a cultural change, I think. The second thing is we need better workloads. The workloads, for example, that uh, I used for my experiments, the spec suite, even though it has been improved consistently over the years, it still was not enough to factor out bias. And so ideally we want to develop workloads that represent your problem domain, 
that, that cover the space so that when you do the experiments on all of them and draw aggregate conclusions from it, your conclusions are actually valid. Third, we need a lot more information on microprocessors, not just to understand why these phenomena happen exactly, but also to better exploit them. I mean, we see 20 percent swings. Maybe those are things you could actually optimize for. You could actually exploit them for 20 percent better performance. Um, most microprocessors that are out there today, we simply don't have lots of information about them. So for example, Intel doesn't tell you exactly how their trace cache works or their loop stream detector works. And Sun has taken a great step forward recently by open sourcing some of the processor design. So you can actually see exactly what is in there. It may be painful, but at least the information is there. And I hope that others will follow suit. Uh, finally, we could benefit from better hardware support. It would be nice if we had metrics for all the key components in the hardware. The hardware support for performance monitoring, sadly enough, has actually been declining over the years. So for Pentium 4, it was really good, where there were 18 registers where you could collect 18 things at once, and there were about 250 different things you could collect. And the cores, the, the new core duos, have two registers. You can only collect two things at a time. So we need a lot better support there. And finally, we, uh, there's some support that is starting to appear in current hardware. So the Core 2 has this facility called Precise Event-Based Sampling, where what you can do is you can actually map hardware events to software events. So you can, for example, say that every thousandth cache miss let me know which instruction it is that causes the cache miss. So you can use statistical sampling to identify the source level entities that are causing the behavior. So that's a really nice facility, but on the core duo, you can only do this for four different events. So it would be nice to have this for a lot more events. So you can attribute hardware behavior to software behavior. So the key lessons that we've learned is that small instrumentation does not mean small observer effect. You can do a little bit of instrumentation, add only a fraction of a percent of instructions, but you change the behavior dramatically. Observer effect and measurement bias, they are unpredictable. We don't know which direction they're going to go in. They're commonplace. We saw them for all of our benchmarks, for all 12 of our benchmarks on four different microprocessors and on two different compilers and they're large enough to easily obfuscate data. They are 10, 20 percent which is oftentimes greater than the benefit from most optimizations in the literature. Now other experimental sciences, they put in a lot of effort into careful experiment design and to try to avoid these phenomena. And at least our literature survey indicates that we have not been doing that. So we have done it easy. We have done the easy experiments, but I don't think we have gotten it right. And finally, let me conclude by uh, some acknowledgments. So this work that I described is in collaboration with uh, Liz Bradley, uh, who does nonlinear dynamics, chaos theory, uh, Matthias Hausfeuert, my former student, Dan Knights, a current student working on machine learning techniques. Uh, Mike Moser, who does machine learning, Todd Mitkovics, who, uh, one of my current PhD students, and Peter Sweeney, a researcher at IBM. And I got lots of feedback on this talk. Uh, I was at IBM last summer, and I got lots of feedback on that um, from my colleagues at IBM. And, uh, and of course, to Ben and Microsoft for uh, inviting me to come and give this talk. Thanks a lot. <laughs> yes, please. Well, I like simulators, so I'd like to go back one page. Um, you said one little thing that I don't think you stressed enough. Simulator avoid one of the two things entirely. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't we leverage that a little bit more? You know, that's a really good point. So simulators avoid the observer effect entirely, but they don't do anything about measurement bias. But unfortunately, there's also a negative side to simulators. And the negative side is that they introduce inaccuracies of their own. So over the years, people have tried to validate simulators. And in almost all cases, they have failed. I mean, 
The most recent uh, effort was the Sim Alpha effort from, uh, from Todd Austin and I think it was Doug Berger. And you know, they found that by tweaking their simulator for microkernels, they were able to get within 10%. But as soon as they ran real programs, they were off by 50%. So the issue is that simulators bring this benefit, but they also bring a severe disadvantage of their own. I agree that bad simulators will lead you to bad conclusions. Yeah, do you have a good simulator I could use? That's, that's the problem, that it's... A processor that is actually implemented exactly as it is. Simulated. Really? Yes. Is this something that you share? Yes, it's out of the research website, it's called eMIPS. What's it called? EMIPS. EMIPS, okay, thanks a lot. And all the, all the work that Chuck Thacker and company is doing with FPGAs is exactly in that direction. This is the RAM project, or? Yes, correct. Okay, yeah, okay. So I agree on your comment on certain tools that have been used in the past. Okay. That doesn't mean that we should throw them away. So Absolutely. So I've highlighted that one big category. Absolutely. The other thing, that, the other observation I would have had is that <clears throat> Uh, I would like to see if you know the measurement bias is correctly reflected into the simulation measurement bias effort. That would be an interesting thing. So you, what you're saying is that if you see a bias in a real machine and you have a simulator that's supposed to model it, do you see the same phenomena? Correct. correct. That is on the line of having a good simulator or a bad simulator. I, I it think doesn't that, reflect that. That is a bad tool. You know. I, I'm not sure if I agree with that. So now I'm supporting simulators. But, and the reason for that is that, that you are putting a very, very high bar for simulators. And one, I think that may be unrealistic. So some of the work that I've been doing uh, also uses nonlinear dynamics techniques to analyze computer systems. And what we are finding is that computer systems are actually chaotic in the classical sense of the word. In other words, a very, very, very tiny perturbation, an epsilon perturbation, can cause behavior and performance to diverge exponentially. So your simulator may be absolutely perfect, but if there was something very slightly different about how you started your experiments, maybe it loaded it at a slightly different address, you can end up with incredibly different behavior. So I think that the validation of simulators by using these end-to-end -end counts uh, or by using bias, I think is putting a higher um, threshold on them that, than probably what's reasonable or realistic. So I, I do mostly networking research and we see measurement bias there all the time, but a lot of times we don't have the opportunity to do controlled experimentation in terms of where we measure things from. Uh, my question is, are, are there known techniques in, in what you do or other sciences where you're given a set of data to just determine whether it has measurement bias or not? Unfortunately, you can't. Uh, you can't do that until you know, I mean, so for example, uh, yeah, unfor I don't know how to start even answering that question, but unfortunately there is no systematic way of detecting it, because if there was, right, that would be the end of it. You would just do your experiments, if there's bias in it, then you do something else. But if there's no bias, you're done. Unfortunately, you can't do that. You could make progress if you knew, like, so, so you were making some assumptions in, in the, one of the first techniques you had uh, about uh, the kinds of uh, populations. Yes. And uh, would that kind of information you see, you can see whether that's correctly reflected in your data or not, distribution of variables you think that matter? Think that, that you can definitely do, right? So you're doing your experiments in network systems, you collect from a whole bunch of people, and you make sure that, that, that there is diversity along the dimensions that you know to be important. But obviously there might be other dimensions that you're completely unaware of that are really affecting things. But yeah, I mean, that, that's exactly the right way to use these ideas, where you identify what causes bias and make sure that you are diverse with respect to those dimensions. Yeah, it's a good way to do it. Um, I, I wonder, you know, if we go back to the old days where processors are not as complicated, would you think that we'll be seeing this? Uh, you know, I, I, I think, think that... that ...where things are more predictable than this. Yeah, this is a very good question, and it's kind of like asking, are you more chaotic than I am, right? So it's, in some sense, it's a very difficult one to answer, but, the, but if you look at the theory on chaos, 
which is what advises a lot of this work, you realize that you don't have to have a complex system to be chaotic. Uh, and one of the prerequisites for being chaotic is that your system must be non-linear. So computers, any computer system that has, for example, a cache is non-linear because some memory references cost one cycles and others cost 10 and yet others cost 100. So you can get this entire spectrum of costs. So if you have a computer system that has no non-linearity in it, then probably you don't have to worry about it because then if it's a linear system, then if you add 2%, then you get 2% out. But if you are going back to even, for example, a, you know, MIPS 2000 or something from 1992 or something, it is very simple compared to today's processor. It's actually a processor that you can actually fully understand what it does. But it still has caches and so it still has nonlinear behavior. So it may also exhibit chaotic behavior. Which is why they disable caches on real time systems. That's right. right. Yeah. yeah. I would add, I mean, as long ago as the early 90s, we were getting plus minus 20, 30% on 486s just by the order in which we sorted the procedures. Yeah. Right. Right. Absolutely. Which, you know, at that point, you know, it, it did beg the question of, why are we working on optimization? <laughs> and this is a very good question, right? Yeah, so, I mean, the interesting thing, too, is, yeah, I was going to mention this, that at some level, optimization um, has, at its heart, this notion of determinism. That, you know, basically, you do this optimization, and it gets better, right? And right. I think at the heart of, the, you know, your talk and the sort of observation about bias is that systems are inherently non-deterministic. I mean, you know, it's like just because it works in one, one circumstance doesn't mean it will work in another. And, right. and if you assume that every system is totally different, you know, then, then you have to optimize across all of them, which, you know, is much harder and maybe, uh, you know, not a very good goal in general. Right. It, it becomes a hard, maybe just not, you know, not optimizing, but not pessimizing. I mean, it's, it's more like you right. don't want right. to lose a huge amount of performance. Yeah. So actually it was a lot of the work that was done here and elsewhere on you know, laying out basic blocks and procedures that sort of suggested to us that this ought to be one of the first things we should look at in terms of seeing if that's also inducing bias. So. Yes, but there is also an other consideration that that particular optimization of laying out your object correctly is so strong and so valuable that it resists all of the noise that you can throw at it. No matter what you do, you will see the effect, and if you do it right, you will win. So that, that's a clear win. But you know, I think that the, the observation is that many, many things people suggest aren't. Yeah, <laughs> They're it, not that accurate. Correct, but isn't that the fact that you're going, you know, you're going after a percent of optimization right, right. Small, that small, is right. so small that it is confused with noise, and people do not understand there is a measurement error, and they never qualify. How many of those ADA papers ever said about measurement error? Almost none. I mean, it's pretty rare even to give confidence intervals. But I think that there's, there's one other point that I would like to make. So I've shown you these wild swings by changing only two dimensions, or basically you can think of it as one dimension, the memory layout. If you add all the other dimensions, those swings might get much, much larger. So it's not really appropriate for us to say, okay, if you're not going to you know, believe any research that gives a less than 10% because it may be statistically significant while being less than 10%. No, yeah. If you have a 10%, make sure that your error is indeed 5%. Exactly. That's, that's exactly the right point. Yeah. yeah. When we got to 20 and 30%, we were actually in a system that was getting 10 times speed up. So, right. Like, oh, big deal. Right. Well, that, well that's the other thing is, you know, historically, because processor speeds have been increasing exponentially, Almost anything you could do in the software side is is already in the noise by some definition, right? And so, you know, it's a, yeah. this just sort of you know puts another nail in the in the coffin and says, you know. Uh, but I think that and that particular issue is going to change now, right? So the clock speeds are not ramping up anymore, and so now it's in some sense up to the software to exploit the numerous cores that are out there. Yeah, but then there is this benchmark special thing that kicks in. So it was uh, benchmark special. A processor that does something very good, strange, uh -huh. but that works very well for something. Right. But, but the issue is that, I mean, if you have an application, it may have many different phases, and the different phases may prefer the different 
special processors uh, or they may have different amounts of parallelism in there. So I think exploiting that, I think that this, the role of performance tuning and optimization, I think we'll see a revival now with these multi-core systems. But, you know, I think the other way to look at it is these systems are actually increasing the amount of non-determinism. So you know, at some level, I think an assumption about optimization is that it's optimizing with respect to some baseline. Yeah. And the question is, if unless you, like you've, met, you've shown, unless you characterize that baseline accurately, then it's, it's, it's pointless. And right. so the more non-determinism there is in the baseline, the harder it is to characterize, the harder it is to actually understand that you've got an improvement over it. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's fascinating work. Anybody else? Yeah. Thanks a lot, Armour. Thanks.